Rektanish le hai lani fui vikamus agus tasnulation fein. I hak to Pauline Tull. Gorma got asking Corla. Are you moving I, the motion? I am moving the motion. Gorma. I'm bringing this motion this evening because children's disability services are at crisis point. There are currently at least 40,000 children on waiting lists for assessments or interventions and families have lost confidence in the new progressing disability model as they witness services worsening rather than improving as time goes by. The rolling out of the progressing disability model promised to ensure more equal access for all to therapies. As one parent said, so far it is equal in the sense that no one is getting anything. Parents of children with additional needs have to fight for everything and they are tired and they are worn out and they are contacting me and my colleagues and I've no doubt every elected representative here about the fact that their children are not receiving the supports they deserve. And their concerns are well founded and are confirmed by surveys conducted by As I Am and Down Syndrome Ireland. Children are entitled to an assessment of need under the Disability Act of 2005. And this is an assessment which should indicate if the applicant has a disability, the nature and extent of the disability, the health and educational needs of the applicant and the services required by the applicant. It is a comprehensive assessment and this should be done as a multidisciplinary needs-based approach and completed within six months. But this has been replaced by the standard operating procedure which sees a preliminary team assessment being carried out instead. Now let me be clear, this does not constitute a proper assessment of needs. This is not fulfilling the statutory right under the Disability Act and it must stop. It is necessary to see it, sorry, it is easy to see this when you compare the average time for the completion of an AON is 29 hours, while this PTA takes an average of 90 minutes. Now, I acknowledge that not all children will require full assessment of need, and the preliminary team assessment was meant as a way to identify those children with the most pressing needs. The intention being that those children would then be admitted onto a team where support and services would be provided and further assessment carried out if required. However, the reality is that children who undergo the PTA are then just being put onto another list, a hidden and unaccountable list, or simply uh, being told that they will receive services in a number of years. The clinicians, such as psychologists and speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, etc., are not comfortable whatsoever with this procedure. And there have been an exodus of clinicians from the CDNTs due to this, as they are not prepared to dilute their professional standards so that the HSC can evade its obligations under the Disability Act. The professional or organisations warned the HSC that clinicians would leave, yet they proceeded with this model anyway. There are staff shortages on all of the teams and it's proving very difficult to recruit. Many therapists will not work for the HSE due to very poor working conditions and the lack of progression in their careers. Many of the teams are made up of newly qualified therapists. They need guidance and support, but that's absent. There seems to be poor management, no targets, no performance indicators. So how can the HSE stand over this? Like, how is value for money being measured? And in the meantime, families are forced to fight for everything. They are accessing service privately, even though the cost is excessive, and some are borrowing to provide support for their children that they should be receiving through the HSE. And it's getting to the stage that there is no availability privately either. But what you do, if you're told it will be two years before your child will receive the speech and language therapy they need, or what you do when you're offered five or six sessions of therapy and then nothing, or one session now and another in five months. A proper assessment of need can cost in the region of €1,500, Euro, and parents in many cases have no option but to source that privately as a diagnosis is necessary to gain admittance to a special school, a special class or an autism unit. So every parent wants whatever supports are necessary to ensure that their child can be the best versions of themselves. So, Minister, there have been hundreds of court cases where the state has been brought to court because it has not met its obligations under the Disability Act. So, it's disgraceful the parents have to take this action in the first place. But it's more incomprehensible that these cases are even defended in court. And instead of taking measures to address the problem, the HSE has spent hundreds of thousands of euros defending the indefensible. And now they're trying to skirt their responsibility through the introduction of the preliminary team assessment. The state is also in breach of the Disability Act, where Section 13 of the Act mandates to produce an annual report and publication of aggregate unmet need for the purposes of identifying gaps in service provision and the resources to meet need. The last time a report was published was in 2009. So it is past time to address and to rectify all the shortcomings of the progressive disability model. Gormagut. 
Well, Margaret, uh, first of all, I want to commend Chuck to, uh, Pauline Tully for bringing forward this motion and for giving us all an opportunity to discuss this really important issue. Minister, I think you would accept that parents of children with disabilities or special needs should not have to battle to get access to an assessment of need or services. And over the last number of days, uh, Chuck De Tully and I have met with hundreds of parents in person and through Zoom. And I have to say their experience is one of a constant battle. It was heartbreaking to hear parent after parent talk about how difficult it is to get an assessment, and even if they get an assessment through the standard operating procedure, they go on to a different waiting list for a multidisciplinary uh, assessment, uh, and very often, even after all of that, their children don't get the services that they need. Inclusion Ireland will be publishing the results of a, uh, a survey on Thursday. And again, they tell us that the contents of that survey will confirm everything that we are saying in our motion in relation to how parents feel, the impact it has on their children, and that constant battle. It's a battle to get a comprehensive assessment. We know that the 2005 Act made it very clear that it should be a comprehensive assessment that determines whether the child has a disability, the nature and extent of the disability, and the health and the education needs of the child. This preliminary assessment, in many cases, does not do that. We're being told by many parents that assessment can take as long as 20 minutes. Now, I've been in GP surgeries, and I've been in there longer than 20 minutes. It's a maximum, I think, of 90 minutes, but it's much less than that. And there is no way you can determine a child's disability in that time frame. That's what advocate organisations are telling me, as I am, Inclusion Ireland, Disability Federation of Ireland, and many more are all saying that's the direct experience of families. It's a battle to get the assessment on time. And this goes back to why parents are forced to take the state to court. Now, for any of us that have children in this house, and could you imagine if you had a child with a disability or special needs, and you were forced to take the state to court? How traumatic that would be, that the state should be there for you and your family or your child, but you are left with no choice but to take the state to court because the state is not delivering on its obligations. It is absolutely appalling. Under the 2005 Act, uh, the government is meant to publish at least once a year the aggregate uh, nature of the assessment of need, uh, the services that should be provided to children. It should be published once a year, which sets out then the overall need in terms of how many staff uh, that's required. That hasn't happened, I believe, since 2009. Why is that the case? And yet uh, we're being told that, uh, that uh, that's, that, that's happening. I know you're, you're talking to your officials, but that's what I've been told. Uh, and maybe you can clarify if, if, if that has happened, because we, we can't get access to those uh, reports. And, and then over 80% of children who are fortunate enough to have an assessment of need don't get access to any services. That's what was in As I Am survey last year. Let's wait and see what's in Inclusion Ireland survey on Thursday. But why should it be that constant battle? And I have to say to the officials that are here, to those in the department that are listening, and to politicians in government, we have to once and for all decide that we're going to do something about this and then do it. So in the first instance, we need to listen to what the Children's Ombudsman said when he cited a number of recommendations in relation to the 2005 Act. It was very strong in relation to a right to an assessment of need. But I think that the standard operating procedure and what some parents quite rightly describe as a, a short screening is not a proper assessment, but yet it's for that preliminary assessment when the six months kicks in and the clock starts ticking, not for those who go on a separate waiting list. That's not fair, and rightly it's seen as waiting lists within waiting lists, hidden waiting lists, and that's not what we should be doing. So the 2005 Act needs to be strengthened. strengthened. The Epson Act needs to be strengthened. We need a new autism strategy underpinned by legislation. And then we need to make sure, in very, very simple terms, we communicate to parents exactly what their child is entitled to, how the child is going to get access to those services, that they will get their assessment on time, and that they have a clear service statement or assessment of need which sets out exactly what services the child is entitled to, and then we set about trying to provide those services as best we can. 
And what all of the advocate organisations and parents have said to me, the critical solution here is a proper workforce planning strategy. We need to train more therapists and child psychologists and specialists. We need to train more uh, speech and language therapists. We need to recruit more and we need to retain more. And if we don't do that, Minister, we're not going to address the problems and the waiting list will get longer. I have to Donegal Leary. There are four speakers left. Volum Tracy Lewer and Kate Olshiesle and Chalk the Tullyks and Chalk the Colnan, Lashon Roan Shaw, Carla Kaelin. We parents have to fight tooth and nail to get the basic supports for our children. We feel outcast and abandoned. We have given up our jobs to care full time for our children with no support. I am scared and upset. I don't know what's ahead for my son. These are some of the quotes from stories that parents of children with disabilities in Cork have shared with me. A Corkig Deskert Nakarov, Derna Figuri go three kid dinner and Fanacht er Masanu rate the she, Kate Truck a hain, a Todenuk, the stoid a do, the procession, Kate's a do, a Todenuk le three V, Uxgovitz a Kahar, Lani, a Tod a Fanacht le Kriaknu, the procession, Masanu rate the she. Minister, the progressing disability model at present is not fit for purpose. Ther therapists have been removed from special schools without a functioning alternative to accessing these crucial therapies. The Children's Disability Networks teams in Cork are far, very far from being up and running. One such team in North Cork City are so under pressure due to staff and gaps that have never been filled that they've actually contacted parents and encouraged them to complain to the HSE, they, their own employer, in the hopes of getting some support. The figures in my constituency are dire. Team 11 for the South East of the City is meet, missing a psychologist and 2.2 speech and language therapists. West Central Cork is missing 2.6 occupational therapies, 1.3 speech and language, 2.2 psychologists. The same story in Carrigaline, uh, one physio, half a speech and language therapist, over two occupational therapists, two psychologists. It goes on and on and on. Family representative groups were meant to be set up under progressing disability to allow parents to be fully engaged. Not one has been invited uh, when, to participate when I asked them in Cork. One local mother was told by an official in your office, Minister, that funding would be given so that therapeutic supports uh, taken from schools would be reinstated in special schools. That has still not happened, Minister, and you said that on the 28th of January to that parent. To put it plainly, Minister, this uphill battle, this fight for assessments of need for reinstatement of crucial therapies, for basic things that their children have a right to cannot continue, they're being denied their ability to meet their potential. And I too want to commend my colleague Pauline Tully for the work that she has done in bringing forward this motion here this evening. For a parent with a child who has additional needs, the battle for services and for supports is constant. A parent may notice something when their child is only two or three years of age, their balance, their eye contact, their ability to do things that children of the same age can do. And that is just the start of a very long road. A parent may know very little about the world they're about to enter when they seek an assessment for their child to seek a diagnosis and to ensure that they get their child the help that they need. Some parents cobble together the money to go private, some get into debt just to get that initial assessment, and then they realise they're just moved on to another waiting list. Without that initial assessment, a parent will struggle to qualify for the domiciliary care allowance. They don't have enough medical evidence because they can't get the assessment, and so they cannot get that really important income support. The child starts school, they haven't been assessed, they require additional supports, they can't get an SNA. Everything is a battle, as has been said, from assessments to therapies to day services to respite, and it shouldn't be a battle. And why is it that rather than fix the actual issue, the delays and the waiting lists, that the government instead choose to create something to make it look like you've done something, when instead you mislead and you make the situation worse. You've created, as has been said, what can only be described as a screening exercise, a pre-assessment to the assessment of needs to cover up the failure to that obligation you should meet as set out in the Disability Act. It is of no benefit to the child or to their parents. The child is no further on after it, and it instead they move on to another waiting list. And it's now common knowledge that you have to go to court in order to get your child the services they need. And in my own constituency, there are hundreds of children on waiting lists across speech and language, occupational therapy, physiotherapy. 
One mother in my constituency, her son is 17, he has autism. She has fought and fought his entire life. She is his, his voice and she's always been his voice. She told me how a neighbour approached her the other day. She is concerned about her own child. The mother said she felt sick at having to tell the young mother what she actually has to face into and the road that she has ahead because there's almost a fear of actually entering the system uh, in the first place. So I would ask the Minister here this evening, the solutions are brought forward, they're in this motion. Fix the actual issue uh, and fix it now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Tully, for bringing forward this proposal here this evening. Waiting lists for assessments and needs for children across Lee Shoffley have been spiralling out of control for years. In Lee Shoffley, according to figures supplied by the HSE, just 17% of assessments and needs applications were completed within the legal time frame of six months, and overall in CHOA it's 15, 16%. These are shocking, shockingly poor outcomes. I had a constituent contact me, to, contact me uh, this week, and she told me, she told me, and she told me again this morning, that her situation, she's a single parent, working full time, she's a six year old girl with a learning disability, she's paying a mortgage and tra has to have a car to travel to work in the other end of the county. She's paying privately for physiotherapy and occupational therapy for her daughter. Her child has been referred for an autism assessment. And the mother said, and I quote, I just can't afford much more. I, I'm watching my, watching my child suffer, unquote. That child will now most likely be forced to go private to get that assessment as well, which, could be, which will be in excess of a thousand euros they, that she needs. Many parents are borrowing the money, and you hear this and I hear it. That's the reality on the ground. Sinn Féin is committed to trying to put forward proposals to end this constant battle that we have in trying to get children's needs assessed. And this evening we're putting forward our proposals, firm, constructive proposals. We're calling for a roadmap minister to be produced, which will ensure that all children will receive a comprehensive assessment of need within the time frames, within the time frames set down the Disability Act, and not a making up assessment that just clears the waiting list and then they have to go for a further assessment, as has been outlined by the previous deputies. Sinn Féin is also calling for a plan to be established to recruit, and this is very, very important, to recruit and develop ad adequate levels of health and social care professionals to deliver the services in line with the best practices. We need that pipeline, and we've amplified this here a number of times. That's a concrete proposal that we are making. Our, our 2022 budget, the bu our budget proposals, for this year included costings for over for 150 additional psychologists, 100 occupational therapists and 250 speech and language therapists. This is the least we can do to ensure that children are not left behind in the early years and that that intervention, when it's really important, is met at that point in time. <clears throat> Minister, if there's one group that knows what is right for children with special education requirements is their parents. Their love for their children is unconditional and they will fight and lobby to ensure their child gets the appropriate supports in a timely manner. In my experience, the parents of children with special education requirements are the bravest and most determined people that I know. They never, ever give up. On Friday night last, I was, I was delighted to attend the fundraiser in support of ASC Ireland and our Lady of Lourdes School in Limerick, which is a fantastic school. It was organised with the full support of the school by Helen Connolly, mother of Jack, who has autism and attends the school. Her fight was not just for her son, but for all the kids in that school. There is no, this is so typical of the parents of, of children with special needs. They will do everything and anything for their child, but they need to stay, stay to step, step up to the mark as well. The government is failing children who have disabilities and additional needs. Parents must battle tooth and nail to access supports for their children. This is abundantly clear when we look at the backlog of for assessments. Parents shouldn't have to contact mine or any other constituency office to try and have their child assessed quick, quicker. Waiting for an assessment is extremely stressful. The not knowing of what the issue is is an extremely stressful time for parents. In the Midwest region, the waiting lists are extremely concerning. As of October 20, 2021, there was 148 children waiting 12 to 18 months for an initial speech and language assessment, with an incredible 53 people waiting in excess of 24 months. For even one child to be waiting that long is a scandal. That is two years in which children and the development is damaged. It is not just what I believe, it's what the experts say repeatedly. This isn't some sort of anomaly, unfortunately, it seems to be the norm. These are young people in the best years of their life and their development is being stymied because the state cannot provide them with an assessment in a timely manner. Awareness for those children with special education requirements has come 
on leaps and bounds in the last decade. Children with additional needs can live full and happy lives, as can their parents if they are assessed early with the correct structures and supports put in place. The Disability Act of 2005 provides that an assessment of need must be commenced and completed within a six-month period. In many two cases, this time frame is missed. It is disgraceful that so many families had to take court cases against the state because of its failure to deliver a prompt assessment of a child's needs. Parents should never have to do that. Initial assessments should be within the requirements set out in the Disability Act. Like most things in our health service, we have a two-tier reality when it comes to the provision of assessments. So many parents, both those who can afford it and those often who cannot afford it, opt to pay for private assessment of needs and therapies as a child cannot afford to wait for the public appointments. The government needs to end this debacle and they need to outline what steps they're going to do. So. Oh, gosh, the message from Select Committee. The Select Committee on Environment and Climate has completed its consideration of the following supplementary estimate for public services for the service of the year ending on the 31st of the 12th, 2022, vote number 29. So, Anish Sinn Féin, to Sean Crow. Two and a half minutes. Uh, the government has all but abandoned its responsibilities to children with disabilities. They won't even publish how badly they're failing to meet the crisis. They use double speak to try and hide how badly they're doing. They shuffle children around and put them in different categories to make it look like progress has been made. It's dishonest, it's deceptive. The way we are warehousing these children instead of investing in services and getting them the therapy and assessments they need is downright immoral. Because all the sleight of hands in the world by the government and the HSE will not change the reality. 8,000 children on speech and language waiting lists. 9,000 children waiting on psychology. 18,000 children waiting on occupational therapy. We're failing these children and we're causing them long-term harm by doing so. The, children must, the government must fulfil its obligations under the law of the Disability Act, and we cannot have families being forced into taking legal actions just so their child can get an assessment or access to care. We cannot deny vulnerable children their rights any longer. Without an assessment or early intervention, the quality of a life of a, for a child with additional needs regresses. There is no early intervention in this state, not when waiting lists for urgent interventions by school age teams take long months or even years. And we're making families lives of misery by forcing them into legal action or to pay for costly private assessment just to try and get their child on a waiting list for care. And what has the government response to the assessment waiting list been? To slash the amount of time that a child gets in an assessment when they finally get that far. 90 minutes is all a child now gets. It used to be 29 hours. We are short of 400 key staff across the disability teams. A minister stood in this stall in October and told us that in my own area of CHO7, there was not one child waiting on assessment of need. The HSE told me at Christmas, a couple of months later, that there were 1,800 children who had not even reached stage one of the process in CHO7. Another example of the double speak from government. Thanks, uh, last time, Carla. Uh, Minister, uh, I would like to thank my colleague uh, Pauline Tully for bringing this motion on assessment of needs for children with special educational requirements. Back in October 2020, the OCO published a report called Unmet Needs. It sets, it sets out the challenges experienced by children who may have additional needs and require assessments. The report highlighted the violations of the rights of children with additional needs and delays to assessments. The HSE are obliged to commence a full assessment within three months of a child's application, and this must be completed within six months. In, within six months. in most cases, this is not happening. Because of the length of time children are waiting, families are forced to go down the private route and pay for assessment, as many fear their children are being left behind by this government. For other families, the private route is not an option. Minister, why is it that parents of children with additional needs have to fight tooth and nail to get their children what they are entitled to? They have to fight for housing, they have to fight for school places, they have to fight for SNAs, they have to battle for school transport, the battle for speech and language classes, carers allowance, 
They have to fight for any and all kinds of assistance. Yet the biggest fight they face is getting what they're entitled to from the state. In the Mind, the Gap Report, Dr Niall Muldoon, who was Ombudsman for Children, said, It is high time for children with additional needs and their families to stop having to battle barriers. Our laws and policies must serve all our children and allow them all to access the best education possible. It is our duty to empower them to be the best they can be and the structures must be there to support their development. It is high time for the state to lead, not impede. We know that back in October 2021, the Minister of State told Oireachtas that there were over 400 staff shortages in children's disability services. Is this going to be addressed? This must be a priority for any government. A lot of parents are so tired and exhausted of fighting the system to get their children what should be a given in any kind of a society. We are not much of a society if we don't look after children with additional needs and their parents. Thanks. I do want to thank my colleague um, Pauline Tully for all the work that she's put into this, but on an ongoing basis with parents. I think it's very important and I think she's proven to be a very important voice for children with disabilities and for their parents and I want to thank her for that. And Minister, I don't doubt that you really want to do something about this, but you know of the waiting list and you know of the parents because if they're contacting me and my colleagues, I know they're contacting you as well. And I know that you know each and every case. When you look at your child and, and, and you see that something isn't quite right and they're not um, behaving, maybe the way another child that they've had is, they know that something is wrong and there the battle starts. And they battle and they battle and they battle. Now, I listened uh, to your colleague um, uh, just saying that you wanted suggestions or you wanted a, a, um, that you wanted some solutions to it. We need a new autism strategy, absolutely, and we need it urgently. But the workforce planning strategy as well, we need a workforce planning strategy. You know yourself, like the places aren't there for what we for speech and language therapy, for psychologists, all of the other um, um, disciplines that we need across the board. We need proper integration between third level and um, uh, between third level and the HSC, and it's not happening. And Minister, you know, like the craziness. Say we have a speech and language therapist and she has the wonderful news that she's pregnant and she's going to be going off on maternity leave. When do we recruit for the position? We start recruiting when she leaves, not on the day that it's announced. And if somebody gives in their notice, it's the same thing. Like, just riddle me that. You know, it, it just, and I'm sorry, I know that you can't answer back at this, but in your, in your thing. But, yeah. They don't, they don't cover maternity leave. What, well, that's a, great, a disgrace in itself, in, in itself that they can't. And it's not equal in all areas. Where you come from, rural areas, where I come from, Mayo, the CHO2 area, like, they just, they don't, things don't work together. And there has to be somebody responsible within the system for making things happen and making things work together. And they're not. And you're the minister. And, and I want you to just hold people accountable Hold them accountable within the HSE because we're told about millions and millions. Is there another speaker after me? Sorry, okay, right, okay. I'm going to uh, uh, give away here. But we're told about millions. Of, that's no good to the child and the parent who are waiting tonight. Thank you. Maybe they're giving you the slot on International oh. Women's Day. Oh, oh, oh. Deputy Pat Daly. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Pat. Sorry, Pat. This is, uh, again, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Deputy Pauline Tully for all the work that she has done in relation to this and also for taking the time to help some of my own constituents uh, and, and talk to them over the phone. This is a situation where a lot of parents came to me without any, uh, when they hadn't dealt with the system uh, before, and even people who were able to afford uh, private care are shocked by the level uh, or the, the lack of any uh, services available to them. Uh, they struggled to, f to get assessments. They had to go private. Uh, they, they were on waiting lists. And some of the, um, the, the people that they are dealing with told them that they had a caseload of speech and language therapists. A caseload, the recommended caseload was 25, and they had a caseload of 400 uh, children to, to be dealing with. Uh, there needs definitely to be workforce planning in relation to all of this because the stress on the parents of the children has led to, to marriages breaking up and uh, making it more difficult, uh, a more difficult situation even worse. 
uh, the structure has to be made for the children to make it as effective as possible and an early intervention can mean, make a difference between a full life and a significantly diminished life. Uh, we, we've spoken before about the issues about uh, children with special education needs and it's getting more grotesque. The courts are getting more and more crowded with cases taken by desperate parents. And uh, Ju Mr Justice Meenan recently questioned whether such cases were the best use of the, the, the justice system's resources given how many are settled. Uh, I think practically all of them are settled and, and costs awarded. While constrained by the separation of powers, the judge has a point. Cases while they're settled, the preferable scenario is one where no case at all needs to be taken, uh, with proper provision of services made instead. So this would avoid a, like a situation where we saw recently in Kerry, where uh, as part of the CAM scandal, children who needed special education supports uh, were waiting and waiting, and they, they were prescribed sometimes antipsychotic medication when they were suffering from social anxiety and, and issues like that. Uh, this obviously harmed them, compounding the, the developmental issues that they were experiencing and causing sometimes maybe permanent damage to them, cutting off what could have been a fruitful development arc for them with the proper supports. So in cutting corners and pinching pennies, government has created uh, hostages to foster, but it's the lives of these children uh, that we're dealing with urgent action in, uh, out, in this, line nine of the steps outlined in our motion are required. Uh, uh, Minister, thank you for that reply and I've been listening to all the speakers here. I'm going to be fairly brief. Just in the CHO four year we hear between speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, 5,472 children. It doesn't make for great, good reading. Um, but also what I want to look at here, you're asking about you know, getting more ideas and stuff. And you've heard some people, and I have my own personal experience of families, very young families, that had to go to court and spend four or five years going to court to actually get the proper care, right? And I, I, I'm actually using this opportunity to call on the state and the HSC to actually stop using state solicitors using public money to fight families in appeal cases. That should be just absolutely struck out straight away. This family actually won the fight, and it's not the only family I know. Um, on top of that, uh, it would be remiss of me if I didn't thank our own Deputy, Deputy Pauline Tully for bringing this motion forward. And I am very happy that the government are not opposing it. And from all speakers from all sides of the House here, yes, if we work together, we can get it done. I've worked with your Minister in the previous term, and I know you're passionate as well. And so I've, I've always been fair as well to say, look, we're here to represent the people outside the House. There is urgency on this. And if we can work collectively on this and do the right thing, it will drop the stress levels. We're on about mental health issues and stuff and how families are stressed and marriage breakups. I've seen it in my own you know, family. When kids, when families have to go private, but it's amazing you can go private if you have enough cash. And the child is seen within a very, very, very short period of time. And I can't understand why we have such competition between our own health service and the private practice. But I would say, you know, if we can work together on this, and do the right thing, from, but there's certainly urgency in this. Uh, I'd like to say more, but I suppose I do have other deputies that want to speak. Go to Margaret. I have to say the most frustrating and angering part of being a TD is when you're dealing with parents who are getting in touch in order to expedite them getting health care for their children. I have, think it has to be said that no parent should have to contact any elected representative to tell them the most intimate details of the medical needs of their child in order to try to secure disability, occupational therapy um, or any other service that their child desperately um, needs. No parent should have to fight for years to secure an assessment of needs that the law states should be delivered within six months. And just to reiterate, it's not just that government is failing those children and their families. Government are breaking the law by doing so. In my own HSE region, last October, there were 1,956 children waiting an initial assessment for speech and language therapy. 1,444 for occupational therapy, 1,105 for physiotherapy. 
Each of these numbers represents a real child that has been denied the right to live fulsome lives. They represent families that are going through the hell of trying to deal with HSE bureaucracy um, and are going through hell in terms of listening to broken promise after broken um, promise. I met a mother today. She had travelled a long distance um, to be here for tonight's debate. She has two sons with special needs that have been cared and loved by their family all their lives but they have been let down by this state every single day of their lives, and they're still being let down. Their mother, who has enough to be contending with, had to establish a charity herself alongside other families in order to provide her children with a service that should have been provided by the state. It's not good enough. It's not fair. In fact, it is a scandal. I want to commend Deputy Pauline Tully for the work that she has done and for bringing this motion to the House. I want to commend this motion. I want to welcome the fact that it has been unopposed here tonight, but it needs to be followed through with real action and with the implementation of the words as well as the actions required in this motion. Um, thanks very much, Cahirlach. First of all, I also want to commend my colleague, um, Deputy Tully, and thanks, Minister, for your reply. I wasn't present for, for the start of the debate. I have two minutes, so I want to really focus. Um, as other deputies have said, it is so frustrating when parents are waiting, and even if it's not for the assessment of need, it can be for speech and language, occupational therapy, and I'm finding an awful lot of parents that are either trying to borrow money, maybe from a credit union, often were only from money lenders, or from family members to try and pay for these therapies privately. Um, and what's becoming a major, major issue, and I wanted to particularly mention this um, tonight in the constituency of Carlow Kilkenny, and in particular in Kilkenny, is a lack of ASD class places. Now, I know it doesn't fall directly, uh, I know it, it falls to the Minister for Special Education, but I did want the opportunity to raise that. Straight away, I can think of 10 children that don't have an ASD class place for September, and these are children that are actually turning six. So they're, either, they're out of the system of ECCE, um, and really parents are at their wits end because the same parents are saying they've had to battle and fight for absolutely everything. They've had to pay for a huge amount of the services, um, either for a private assessment or for the therapies. And now they're saying they're not even maybe being provided with a school place. And ironically, in the same week that children who are starting into junior infants are getting their, their letters, they know they're going to be starting school in September and we're treating children with additional need as second class citizens, not knowing where they're going to be going. And some of them might, might be facing very large distances distances if they do actually um, get the opportunity to get a place. So I wanted to particularly raise that um, issue and I want to again commend Deputy Tolly for her work um, in this area and thank you very much. Cahirlach. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank all those who contributed to this, this debate and for their support for the motion and uh, well, I want to thank the government for, their, for supporting this motion as well. I mean, it's an issue that's affecting children and their families from all parts of the country, and it's, you know, it's, we, I think we all agree it's an urgent issue that needs to be addressed, and it can, children can't continue to wait for supports they're entitled to, and parents can't uh, continue to face ongoing battles for supports or to have to source uh, services privately or take the state to court. I suppose what we're calling for is that the CNDT cease using the operation or the standard operation procedure, and instead ensure a timely access to a full and proper multidisciplinary needs-based assessment. Because I just feel the HSC are using the PTA to have five been taken to court for, any, for not fulfilling its obligations under the Disability uh, Act. And the preliminary team assessment is not an assessment of need as outlined under the Disability Act. And the HSC should stop pretending it is. I do agree with you, though, that the Disability Act needs to be reviewed and updated. It definitely does. And, it, and especially to... I suppose, recognise the fact that we have ratified the UNCRPD and we have an obligation as a state to implement that. Because if we don't, we're going to see a raft of, of actions taken against the, the state here for uh, needs being unmet. Um, and I welcome the fact that the op optional protocol is going to be uh, ratified soon. But again, it's going to allow people to um, take cases to the UN under the optional protocol, again, for cases um, not being met. And like other deputies have referenced court cases and settlements and so on in the HSE and the Department of Health using money, but it, it's our money, it's taxpayers' money. So we, the taxpayer, are paying for something we don't agree with. We don't agree that the HSE should be actually fighting these cases in yeah. court. Um, so there's a need for a cross-departmental strategy on workforce planning. 
and a clear plan on training, recruitment and attention of sufficient health and social care staff is required. I think uh, the HSE need to sit down and discuss this with the professional organisations that represent the various therapists and health professionals in the CNTTs. At the moment, they're refusing to engage with them. And they have um, uh, it, things that they can do, help to address the issue there. I think we just need to take everybody on board and, and look at everything. Um, we also need a fully costed and time-bound implementation strategy for disability services. Like, we have the disability capacity review. It identified significant unmet need. There's no point conducting reviews if we're not going to address the findings. Um, you mentioned there um, another element that hasn't been enacted of the PDS model, and that's the family forms. And I welcome the fact that they're going to be established because parents need input into the teams. And, you know, and be fully informed of what's happening. At the moment, they're not. What they're being offered are online, online courses. And many parents, parents have already taken the courses, but they're being basically threatened. Uh, if you do not take the courses, you will be removed off the list. Now, that's, that's terrible. That should not be happening. Um, and like parents welcome the courses alongside therapeutic intervention from a professional, but not as an alternative, because parents are not trained therapists. Um, last year as well, you, you paused the removal of therapists from special schools, but I'm being informed that the therapists are removed, and they might be engaging with the schools, but they're not engaging with the students. They're engaging with the staff. So it's not on the same part that it was. Like, and again, some are pointing out there was no risk assessment taken of doing this as e either. Um, I think we need to see weight in this published. You know, we need to see a comprehensive list of who's waiting on assessments and who's waiting on interventions and so on, because I just don't feel we're not being told the truth about it. Um, and also, I mentioned earlier, the government need to recommence without delay the reporting of data and publication of reports pursuant to Section 13 of the Act um, so that they can plan for unmet need. And I mean, I think all the teams need clear targets and performance indicators. I mean, there needs to be ongoing checks on how the service is operating. Outcomes need to be measured. Otherwise, how do we know if the services are working? And people need to be held accountable if the outcomes are not being met. I mean, I think the whole idea uh, around the establishment of the CNDTs was to ensure quicker access for children with more complex needs to services. But that's not happening, because the ones with less complex needs are supposed to go to primary care, and those with mental health or need of mental health support are supposed to go to CAMS. What we find is the three, all HSC bodies, fighting among themselves for staff and saying, oh, no, that, we don't. We won't uh, support that child. That child should go to your service. That child, but you, that's not fair. So children are being left out in the cold. And I know you mentioned that there will be more senior posts, you, but the PTA is a huge problem for senior clinicians. They don't agree with it, and I can't see you getting them back into the teams while it remains. Sorry, I know I've been over time. Apologies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy Tully. Um, August on Deesport Tartig and Buinti Show, Tom Conan Keshtakar, August Sheehan Kesh, no good name Tifer on Tarishkant. I'll put the question, and uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Nachakti Atar Haven Keshta, Aberdeen Show. And Nachakti Atar Inakwina, Aberdeen Neil. Sheelam Gowil on Kesht, Richard, in my opinion, the question is carried.